he has made Valorant fans all over the world fall in love with him. He's pretty much single-handedly put his nation on the map, and he just might be the greatest opera this esport has ever seen. Kang Kang in his young career with Edward Gaming has been nothing less than memorable, with so many iconic moments that he just might deserve the Jerry West treatment and become Valorant's logo. And he has done all this in one of the most underdeveloped regions in the game right now. But we remember all the plays and know the name, but was Kang Kang during his best period of play actually world class? Or was it all hype? So I dove back through Kang Kang's journey in Valorant and took a deep look at every important stat and moment that will tell us the truth about his prime. So unlike most of the players I've covered throughout the series, Kang Kang didn't come from another esport as he's a homegrown Valorant talent that joined back when the game first started in 2020, just as he turned 16 joining RNG to compete in the Chinese scene, which for the next three years, the game wouldn't even be available to play in that region, requiring all Chinese players to have to use a VPN even to compete, putting the region as a whole behind the rest of the world in the esport. But Kang Kang was determined to keep pace and even exceed what the other top players like Durka, Tens, and CNED were doing in these early international events, while Kang Kang was just forced to watch Valorant history unfold without him. But he knew he would eventually get his chance to play against the top dogs if he just continued to improve. So through early Valorant, he turned from team to team, quickly showing that there was something about him that was just different than what other players could do. He had the reflexes and reaction time of a god gamer. As when someone would even let a pixel peek Kang Kang's op, they were done for as he just abused the insta-dashing jet to perfection against early Chinese competition, resulting in some crazy scorelines for him right away. But his story didn't truly start until March 5th, 2022, when he played his first match with Edward Gaming, one of the premier Chinese orgs in esports, who has competed recently in Riot's other game, League of Legends. EDG wanted to be ready when the Chinese region was exposed to the rest of the world, so they picked up Kang Kang before the 2022 season started, soon after it was announced that China at the end of the year would have a chance to qualify for champions, but it wasn't guaranteed as only the top two teams in China would even qualify for the East Asian LCQ, where they would have to somehow finish on top against some of the best players in all of Asia. So to even think about making it through to compete on the international stage, EDG knew they needed to build the best team possible, so they built it around Kang Kang. Throughout the early matches with EEG, there were some clear growing pains as while they reached the finals, Chinese equivalent to challengers, Kang Kang was shut down in the most important map to fall second, just after having a map that saw him pick up 37 kills and still lose. But as they played more and more games together, the team around Kang Kang started to slowly rise to his level a bit, as it was no longer a one-man army going into Act 2, where they desperately needed a deep run to put themselves in the driver's seat with the circuit points. And that's exactly what Kang Kang and the rest of the EDG did, as after falling down to elimination early, players like Chi Chu and Nobody stepped up when they needed to, to make it to the grand finals yet again, but this time now using the overpowered chamber, which has made Kang Kang actually unstoppable, picking up 100 kills in the best of 5 that ended with EDG winning in a tense icebox, with him going an incredible 11-1 in first kills to deaths, something that's just unheard of. And with that finals win, Kang Kang and EDG started their dominance to China that's still in effect two years later, being addicted to the feeling of winning, as they go on to repeat in Act 3 to clutch the top circuit spot to qualify for the East Asian LCQ, where so many players and teams already have international experience, and they would all be competing for the lone spot in Champions. But Kang Kang was determined to show what he had for the first time outside of his home country. It was finally his time to start writing his chapter in the Book of Valorant history. And right from the first map, Kang Kang showed that he wasn't slowing down for a second, as he went 20-7 and to help his team win the first map 13-3, to lead to a clear sweep 2-0 to progress in the tournament, where they dominated their next two opponents to make it to the grand finals, sweeping Slayers 3-0 to qualify, and officially represent China on the international stage for the first time. Three years into the eSport, and to really quickly show you how insane he was during the LCQ, he picked up a 268 ACS, which was second just behind Meteor, as well as one of the best entrying on Chamber, going 45 and 26 in first kills to deaths, along with an absurd max kills for a map being 43 against North Eption. Oh, and also he eliminated 47 of his Pacific opponents with the op in just 9 maps, as they went perfect throughout this run, giving them all sorts of hype going into champions, as no one knew how they would come out against the best of the best like Optic or Loud. And once the groups were announced, he found out he was going to be thrusted right into the thick of it, with him matching up with the runners up of the previous masters, Paper Rex with Benkai. And really no one would fault them if they just rolled over and were destroyed, but that's not what Kang Kang and EDG did at all, as they took Paper Rex to the very brink of Pearl, 
with Kenkang on chamber picking up 8 first kills to 0 first deaths, which kept the map so close. But Forsaken was able to end the map to take the lead in the matchup, but they made it this far and wouldn't go down that easily, as they hammered Paper Rex all throughout Icebox, with Haodong stepping up on Viper, and Kenkang continued to open sights up on Chamber, giving them a 10-2 lead after their attacking side, which they converted into a 13-5 win on Paper Rex's map pick causing the opening match to fall down to Haven, to decide if Edward Gaming would pull off one of the biggest upsets of the year, or Paper Rex barely escape with their lives. And it wasn't easy for Kang Kang in the first half, as Jing and Forsaken put the team on their back to win so many rounds that they shouldn't have, keeping the lead into the half. And while it looked like it'd go to the distance, the rest of Paper Rex woke up and ran away with it, even as King King continued to do his job every round for his team, but it just wasn't enough. The firepower wasn't there for this inexperienced team as they fell to elimination losing 13 to 8. And with that heartbreaking loss, they were unable to rebound against Team Liquid, as it seemed King King was the only one with the necessary resolve to continue against the best teams in the world, ending their first international event winless, showing how much a couple rounds can be the difference between a miracle run to put China on the map, or Fallout quickly being an afterthought in the event. So with that bad taste in his mouth, King King prepared for 2023 where there would be so many more opportunities to compete again on the biggest of stages, and truly show what he can do. And while the rest of the world was getting ready for the introduction of the franchise leagues, China was still one year behind, and would be continuing their challengers-like system to decide who makes the two Chinese invitationals for lock-in. So while the rest of the Valorant world was focused on the insanity that was Roster Mania, King King and his team continued to grind as they fought to the Grand Finals, qualifying them for lock-in like everyone assumed. But it wasn't clean, losing once in the group stages and then against the other Chinese representatives, FPX. So going into lock-in where every match was an elimination match, King King and his team were coming in shakier than the last time international fans had seen them. But they weren't given nearly as bad of a draw as in Champions, as they were placed against 100 Thieves, who of course always have extremely high expectations of themselves as they are 100 Thieves after all, but really just look like a good America's team, something that King King and EDG should at least compete well with, as people thought this match could go either way, possibly giving China their first ever international win. But it wasn't meant to be, as their regional shakiness didn't improve at all, as maybe you can blame the death of the chamber meta or the other game shifts that occurred over the offseason, but they were unable to topple 100 Thieves in a map 3 overtime, to already end their appearance in Sao Paulo. And here was the low point for King King in his early career so far, as the narrative started to surround and ingrain themselves in him, where that while he was a technically gifted player and could have great regional success with his team, he and the rest of China were nowhere near ready to truly compete for a Masters trophy. That's what everyone was saying about him as he continued to run through the Challengers events, making both Grand Finals to qualify for another Masters, this time in Tokyo. The hype that had built for Kang Kang and EEG earlier this year and last year had died down as no one really expected them to leave any sort of mark on this event. But this is when the prime of Kang Kang's young Valorant career began. But it didn't start off on the best foot for his team, as he lost to T1 in yet another tough map 3 overtime, with King King continuing to do everything he can for his team, top fragging in every map as Jet, even shutting down Saya player multiple times with the AWP, and so everyone wrote them off as yet another O2 team, a punching bag for the top international teams. But EDG and China wanted to win badly after being disappointed in their first two appearances. So King King delivered. First against Na'Vi where they won Pearl and in 4th overtime with him picking up 22 op kills in a single map. That's just like unheard of. And capped off China's first international win with another nail biting overtime with it being a complete team effort. Then to qualify for playoffs, they defeated T1 in 2 maps with Kang Kang continuing to show that he's the best in the world with Valorant's deadliest weapon, leading to my favorite celebration in Valorant history. With that win, they were now in playoffs, a place thought impossible for a region that didn't even have the game available yet. And while they lost to Team Liquid in a close 3 maps, Kang Kang continued to pick up so many kills against players that were considered world class, looking like the best player on the server win or lose. But here's where Kang Kang stamped his face on this tournament. They were able to upset Loud in 2 straight maps, with it not even being that close, eliminating the second best team in the world, leading to another date with their Pacific rivals Paper Rex. 
And while King King played his heart out and gave the match his all, it wasn't enough against the true W gaming, no matter if they played with the sub or not. Eliminating them in three maps, which again, had the potential to go either way if EEG won the overtime on Fracture, but they were eliminated in fifth to sixth place, being a true dark horse of the event, with King King just putting up unreal numbers as the duelist, with him using the op with such proficiency that we haven't seen a performance like it since. After that impressive run by EDG, Ken Ken continued to dominate China, now as a superstar, with fans everywhere cheering for him. They predictably qualified for champions, where he goes on a similar run as Tokyo, finishing in the top six, with two losses that eliminated them from the event coming from EG and Loud, where it was actually Ken Ken failing to produce at his usual high level that made them drop the final map in both still putting on an unbelievable performance when looking at both his stats, as well as the run they had against some of the best teams in the world. Putting China as a serious contender going into their first year, with the game fully and their own franchise league. But sadly for Kenki and EDG, they have fallen out of their prime this year. With him making so many weird changes such as taking Kang Kang off the op and then deciding that was a bad idea and reinstating him, as well as multiple roster changes and shifts in IGL, causing the once top 6 team in the world heading into this year to fall out of Masters Madrid and Shanghai early, only winning one match so far. He still looks impressive and dynamic every time he hits the stage, but their real issue was explained recently by their head coach after, as he said that while they had success regionally, when they reached those international events, they lacked any real identity as they changed their game plan and philosophies each event to fit more of what the other big teams at the time were doing as they were always afraid of what worked regionally wouldn't work outside of China. And when looking back at each of these events, it's clear that they were doing this as while Kang Kang always did Kang Kang things, his teammates never played the same from tournament to tournament. As some events they'd be more aggressive and W gaming pilled and others they would play much more reserved, wanting to carefully find picks for themselves. And ultimately, this just threw off these inexperienced players that didn't get much scrim time with teams outside of China, leading to maps that saw Kang Kang put up crazy numbers, but the team around him just looking lost and a couple levels below him. So with these problems identified after struggling so far this season, EEG have been making a number of roster changes that they'll hope provide them more success in champions. But do I think Kang Kang and EDG will make a surprise run in their final major event of the year and reignite his prime? While I believe he'll continue to put up unreal numbers and fill my Twitter feed with crazy highlights, I don't see them doing much better than they've been doing, so they could maybe win a match in champs, but anything outside of that would be a huge surprise. But either way, I'm so excited to continue to witness the greatest opera we've seen in the biggest matches, and here's to hoping he and his team's prime isn't just a one-time deal.